In case you missed the previous video, I got some new paints to add to my Da Vinci watercolor collection. It's their autumn set of six fall-friendly colors. Hi, I'm Irene, and here are the accoutrements for this session. I prepared some swatching strips using Strathmore 500 series cold-pressed watercolor paper. Not bad, huh? I used a ruler and everything. Well, everything meaning a hole puncher and a waterproof marker to jot down the pertinent information. Specifically, a Faber-Castell Pitt Artist Pen with a 1.5 bullet tip. With that boring lead-up out of the way, now it's time for the fun part. Paint porn. Oops, did I say porn? I meant porin. Some people call it squeezin' or squirtin', but I call it pourin'. <laughs> Not to be mistaken for the act of pouring paint from a bucket onto paper or canvas from a great height, because I think that's also a thing. There's a lot to like about Da Vinci watercolors, from their range of colors to their budget-friendly pricing, but there's one thing that's not often mentioned, and that's how nicely they pour out. There are a few exceptions, but on the whole, they fill a pan easily and dry to a smooth, even surface. That's been my experience, anyway. It may be a small thing, but it's one that stands out for me. After pouring my first pans of Holbein watercolors, resulting in a lumpy, bumpy palette, I made it a habit to stir my freshly poured pans, even if it doesn't need it. Admittedly, I can be overly cautious about a lot of things, so I like to balance that out by being totally reckless about other things. Like how <laughs> several times I let the paint get dangerously close to overflowing the pan. Living life on the edge. It's a thrill a minute here at the Inkwork Studio. Some thoughts about the fall season would be apropos, but I'm just not feeling it right now. Instead, I want to talk about summer and those old soda fountain spots. I understand the soda fountain machine dates back to the 1800s, but apparently it didn't become really popular until the early 1900s. Imagine the Gibson Girl ice cream parlor from Disneyland's Main Street, but with an emphasis on beverages. Oftentimes, a soda fountain was merely a counter at the local pharmacy. But as a kid, back in the 70s, I recall getting an ice cream sundae at the soda fountain inside Woolworth's department store. They even served hot meals, making it a sort of diner hybrid. Even back then, though, it was considered a bit of a throwback, because the soda fountain's real heyday seems to have been the 1950s. I would love to see it revived, yeah? A place to meet and socialize over a carbonated beverage and share a plate of hot french fries. Or you could opt for a root beer float or a banana split. That reminds me, I found one of my favorite food documentaries on YouTube, An Ice Cream Show by Rick Seaback. It was aired on PBS back in the 90s. If you can deal with VHS quality, I recommend it to anyone who loves ice cream. Which has to be everyone, right? <sighs> Summer. Growing up, we didn't get to travel or do tons of fun things when school was out, so I always dreaded the inevitable how I spent my summer vacation essay on the first day back at school. No way was I going to confess to watching soap operas, picking berries, and pulling weeds for three months. The best one was when I claimed I dedicated my entire summer to self-reflection and personal enlightenment, leading to a happier, more fulfilled me. My sixth grade teacher didn't know what to do with that. 
but I recognized it for the important moment it was, the beginning of a lifelong interest in creative writing. I waffled back and forth over which brush to use, and I'm so glad I settled on the Princeton Neptune square wash. At three quarters of an inch wide, it quickly covers a sizable area. That's no doubt helped by the soft and thirsty synthetic squirrel hairs. This, along with my Neptune quill, are a couple of my favorite brushes for watercolor. I was skeptical of Strathmore's 500 series watercolor paper, having had less than impressive results with their 400 series option. On one hand, this 500 series is 100% cotton, which is good. On the other hand, the uniform, almost grid-like surface texture worried me a little, but I was pleasantly surprised by how well these swatches turned out. I mean, I really like how both the paints and paper performed here. So further study is called for to figure out if Strathmore 500 really is good for serious watercoloring. But that's an experiment for another day. While the initial swatches turned out great, I really wanted to show some layering or glazing. So I went back with a size 2 round Neptune, adding a simple leaf design. The two black lines are there to show transparency. You may have noticed that I did not include transparency and light fastness ratings, and that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, while some brands follow standardized rating systems, some do not, so I don't find ratings all that reliable. Secondly, I can see for myself on these swatches how transparent a color is. And thirdly, since I don't display my work, nor do I sell my originals, light fastness isn't something I worry about. At some point, I might like to reproduce my work in tangible forms, such as prints, cards, or stickers. In that case, again, my paint's light fastness wouldn't matter. This kind of ties into the format I chose. This strip format, I mean. It isn't very practical, since I can't incorporate it into my existing swatch collection. I just did it this way for the funsies. If you think too much about it, or make things too rigid, you lose some of the fun and then you lose spark, right? The motivation and the creativity. That's how I see it anyway. You might be wondering, but Irene, what's blue doing in my autumn palette? Blues like the Prussian blue here aren't typically what I associate with autumn, but when you think about it, it makes sense because blue can give you an array of greens, purples, grays, and browns. It's a key mixing component, and I hope to discover and demonstrate the mixing possibilities within this set when it gets closer to fall. Remember way back when I mentioned some things to like about Da Vinci watercolors? Well, I left out the most important, and that's the high quality. Look, I've tried maybe eight or nine different professional grade brands, including the fan favorites like Daniel Smith, M. Graham, Windsor & Newton. Okay, Google Docs, you really need to stop trying to slip that D in Windsor. Sennelier, Schmincke, Magello, and so on. Well, in my opinion, Da Vinci belongs there with the best of them. In fact, in an older video, I chose Da Vinci as my If I Could Only Have One brand. I've yet to change my mind, so if you think I'm way off, give me what for and tell me about your favorite watercolors in the comments. 
Now, I was gently reminded after the last video that Da Vinci, which is produced in Oregon, is not readily available in many parts of the world. So my apologies if I'm coming across as insensitive here. In my opinion, once you get to the top five or so professional watercolor brands, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. Whichever one you choose, you'll be getting a high quality product. So it boils down to nitpicking over specific qualities. That's from the standpoint of choosing by brand first, but there are plenty of people who select individual colors across multiple brands. It doesn't have to be the Cola Wars after all. Uh, Team Coke here, by the way. Just saying. The point is, there's no need to be loyal to one brand. One artist might value transparency over all, while another might prioritize light fastness. Yet another might take one look at a three-month-old palette of wet and sticky M-gram paints oozing out the side and say, that's the one for me. Uh, no judgment here. I love me some M-gram. I haven't talked much about the individual colors here. That's because I think they speak for themselves. Seriously, each one looks gorgeous to me. Okay, the swatch for Paraline Green was sort of sloppy, but don't blame Da Vinci. That was my bad. I must have cut out the part where I tied on a strip of fabric, probably because it wasn't essential. It was an example of frugality, though, because it came from the placemat I ruined by spilling fountain pen ink on it. I simply ripped a piece from the untainted end, and voila, instant decorative ribbon. I'm happy to share this swatching session. Until next time, if the thought of paint swatching doesn't excite you, maybe switch it up. Nobody's going to burst into your art space and yell at you for doing it wrong. Even if they did, just yell right back. Oh yeah? Well, you lack creativity and enlightenment. Maybe work on that this summer. And stay artsy, my friends.